Uh, first, we have Andrew Staunton, uh, who is the United Kingdom's Consul General here in Atlanta. Uh, he's coming up on his second anniversary in that position uh, here. And in that capacity, he is the senior UK government representative for the Southeast United States. Uh, he's served in a number of other countries beforehand, and we're very excited to have him here to kind of help us understand, you know, what what has happened in the past uh, with this process and, and where Britain is going uh, in the future, more importantly. So, Andrew, thanks for being with us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much, Kyle. Yeah. And our other panelist today is uh, now, a, now uh, also a local here as of about a year, and that is uh, Gilvenis Chilena. Uh, he is the president of the Foundation for Economic Education, uh, which is a national think tank focusing on uh, teaching young people about economics, and it is based here in Atlanta, but you will notice when he starts speaking, he doesn't have a southern drawl. He uh, actually comes to us from Lithuania, where he ran a think tank there prior to taking the reins at Fee, and so he's going to also offer us a great perspective on what's going on. Uh, not just with Britain, but the rest of Europe as, as this unfolds. So uh, Z, as we'll refer to him from here on out, Z, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Kyle. Yeah. I'll try and work on my southern pronunciation. <laughs> just throw in a y'all every now and then and, and you'll fit right in. Uh, that'll be perfect. So uh, Andrew, I, I think the best thing that we could do to start today is, you know, unlike people in, in uh, the United Kingdom who have, who have really followed this in, in uh, every detail for the past, uh, what, we're coming up on four years now, I guess, since the vote. Um, you know, our, our audience may be a little less familiar with why this was something that was even up for a vote and, and why the, the leave vote uh, prevailed over Remain and, and kind of what, what it means. So if you could give us sort of that historical background and then we'll we'll move from there into where we're going from uh, from now on because that's what we want to spend most of our time on today. Thank you very much, Kyle. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be at the Georgia Public Policy uh, event. Uh, I hope we have a very good conversation. I'm looking forward to Z asking me some quite difficult, challenging questions. I remember where I was on uh, June 2016 when the the referendum result came in. I was in Greece. Uh, Greece working mostly on a Eurozone crisis, which had uh, dominated uh, the European Union discourse for, uh, for a number of years. And uh, while that was happening, it was obviously uh, in the background of everybody's mind was the Conservative Party's commitment, should they win the general election uh, a couple of years before, that they would host a referendum on our future membership of the European Union. The Prime Minister of the day, David Cameron, was very confident that he would win that referendum and that the United Kingdom would remain as a part of the European Union. That was not the outcome. I think there was, in the United Kingdom, a sense that uh, the European Union, which we joined in the mid-70s, wasn't delivering everything that people thought they were getting into. There were certain topics, certain hot-button issues, such as migration. Uh, such as the ability of the British Parliament, which has stood the test of time for many hundreds of years to take decisions about the laws governing the UK. And there was also a sense that uh, people didn't feel that they wanted to go down that federal vision of a united Europe. And uh, the No campaign uh, successfully uh, worked its way, or sorry, the uh, the Leave campaign successfully worked uh, on a series of issues and built quite a resounding victory. I think it was 17.5 million to 16 point something million against our membership of the European Union. So in the period since, uh, it's, it's, it's actually as I was thinking about it uh, the other day, there have been periods here over the last two years when it's felt that uh, most people I speak to have been binge watching BBC Parliament on Netflix. But uh, obviously, they're a little bit disappointed as during COVID, they've had to find other things to watch because that period of almost three, three and a half years was very controversial, very sensitive. It pitted family member against family member. The politics was tough. There was a minority government at one stage 
and it took a hell of a long time for us to deliver the will of the people as they voted for in uh, 2016. Uh, so finally, on the 31st of January this year, the United Kingdom finally left the European Union. So in those four plus, well, three and a half plus years, it's been a tough period. It's been a period whereby Brexit dominated every public discussion, every media headline. But now we're committed, confirmed, and resolute that we have left the European Union. And what we're now trying to do is make the best of that decision by agreeing a free trade agreement with the European Union. And, and for, for people who maybe aren't familiar with how many areas of life the European Union touched and, and, and what, the, what the arrangement was uh, with its members, I, I remember being really surprised by that when I got to Brussels about a, a decade and a half ago uh, to, to be a journalist there. Uh, there were many regulations on business, especially um, that that were handed down from there. And um, you know, there there was the United Kingdom was always one of the countries that was pushing back on those. But tell us a little bit about how many areas of life the European Union touched, because I think it'll help illustrate for people just what a significant relationship this was and what a significant break it it has been. I I, I will. <laughs> come on to that, Kyle. I, I would just like to, however, uh, make the observation that during our membership of the European Union, the United Kingdom was often one of the most pragmatic members. We worked uh, very successfully to have a lot of these uh, regulations, resolutions, bits of legislation reflect the interests of the United Kingdom at that time. But you have to bear in mind that this wasn't a club we were a member of. This was a union where we pulled huge areas of competence, particularly uh, in regulation, in trade policy, in how our everyday life was. So we had a system of governance uh, that uh, lasted for about more than 40 years. And it's very, very difficult to, uh, uh, to take that, uh, to, to remove yourself from that. So what I like to compare it to, it's like uh, trying to remove a raw egg from a baked cake. It's hellishly difficult. Uh, you don't really know what will what will happen, how much of the raw egg you'll get back, and then the cake never quite turns out as you would imagine. So we we these have been some of the reasons why the political debate in the United Kingdom was so difficult. So you had things like aviation safety, which are uh, uh, which were legislated and uh, governed by uh, discussions and decisions around the European Union. You have aspects of every single part of your life from uh, justice and home affairs cooperation, from environmental legislation. So in many, many areas, while the British Parliament remained uh, first and foremost, there were a lot of uh, legislation and regulations which were being influenced by the United Kingdom, but might not always have been in the best interests of the United Kingdom. And so there was quite a movement within the Conservative Party that the best people to take decisions about the economic, social, environmental policy around the United Kingdom where British parliamentarians and the British government. Very good. And, and Z, I want to, I want to ask you now, um, you know, from a, give a little bit of the historical perspective, the, the, the geopolitical perspective here from, from, uh, the, the remaining United European Union membership, uh, you know, what does it mean to have such a large and important country uh, decide to leave a union, again, not a, not a club, but a, a real, a, a union uh, like the EU is, and, and what, do, what does it do to um, the uh, people's belief in, in the European Union going forward? All right, a uh, couple of things. Uh, so unlike the Soviet Union, you, are, you could actually leave the European Union. So I'm, I'm very much against big government, but I think when people compare, some people compare Soviet Union and European Union and say that the same, I would say not really. You couldn't really leave Soviet Union. And in the UK's case, they left the EU uh, and that's that. So that's one sort of clip uh, on that. Second point, um, the decisions or discussions, uh, what should be the future of Europe? Or should we, do we want to exit or does anyone want to exit? I think that was happening even before Britain decided it was cool. 
So decisions about exits of various countries were happening before. Remember the financial crisis where people, there were some people who were openly calling to throw the pigs out of Europe. The pigs being basically Italy, Greece, Portugal, Spain, and maybe sometimes even Ireland because they were too much, too much in debt. So basically coming in or coming out or even joining later, I think that was always kind of pretty much the, the dynamic in European Union. That being said, uh, the exit of Britain is huge. Yeah, it's pretty much uh, a sizable portion of population. That's around, it's also about 13% uh, of what or the so-called EU budget. I mean, any way you slice it, uh, once uh, UK exited EU, EU became smaller. There's no, no other way to, to go around it. I think that when it comes to the future of EU, uh, two weird things happen. I think, um, and I was, I, was in, uh, I was in London, I think, a week before the referendum, and it was a, a conference organized by Institute of Economic Affairs, one of the sort of also premier leading think tanks in UK. And just like Andrew said, they were having arguments within the organization. You have a think tank of dedicated liberty, uh, people loving, for, uh, working for liberty, for free markets, and even they themselves were kind of, actually, I think they had a young generation going against the old generation. They were, they were split. So I remember in that meeting, I, I stood up and said, guys, please don't leave. We don't want to be stuck with the French. And what I mean by this is, uh, once again, no offense to French people. It's merely some of the dirigis, the policies that France sometimes applies. So I think the Brexit was kind of a referendum on federalism. And UK said no. Now, the funny thing is you would think that perhaps other countries or European Union should take heed and say, well, maybe countries don't want to do that uh, or they don't want more federalism. What I think is actually happening is that countries that wanted more federalism, once again, France, they're saying, okay, now the Brits have left, uh, we, can, we, can, we can pretty much go ahead and sort of integrate even more. Once again, integration is not necessarily a bad thing, but when French talk about integration, what I hear is uh, let's sort of harmonize all the taxes across European Union, meaning that as a country, you could not have low taxes anymore. Uh, and that has been a dream of the French for a long time or let's implement the identical minimum wage across Europe. Once again, I'm, I'm no fan of minimum wage. I think people should earn money, but I don't think minimum wages is, is a way to do it. So, when that, so I'm not against integration of Europe. And I think integration, the way it's happening uh, in terms of a movement of labor, movement of goods, that's a great thing. But then I hear federalization or two-speed Europe, what sort of the red flag pops into my head, uh, some, European Union country wants to take the right of other European Union country to set their own policy and actually compete. So that's, that I think is the danger. And, and tell us a little bit more about what that means in practice for a country like Lithuania, that, it, that is much smaller than France, much smaller than Germany, which you know, are likely to be the two uh, you know, forces driving the, the Union uh, going forward. But uh, you know, when you talk about tax harmonization, when you talk about some of those things, what, what does it mean for a country like Lithuania and, and uh, uh, if, if that were to happen? Well, once again, harmonization is bad if, the, if, we, if we harmonize to the highest tax. And as a, there was a sort of a, I think five years ago, there was an initiative to, I think they said, let's harmonize fuel excise tax. Uh, which you said, okay, what are we going to harmonize it to? Are we going to harmonize it to the lowest levels or are we going to harmonize it to highest levels? So my problem is, so whenever a politician talks, whenever a European Union politician talks about harmonization, they're saying, let's increase the tax to the highest possible. Now, in terms of a dynamics, what it means, uh, many of these decisions are taken in European Parliament and definitely many of the bad decisions are, making, are taken in European, in European Parliament. And European Parliament is kind of like your Congress where it's a, decided uh, what it's uh, the number of representatives you have is determined by how many people live in your country. So let's say out of 700, uh, 700 delegates uh, or 700 members of European Parliament, Lithuania has something like 11, which of course is dwarfed by countries like uh, France and Germany. So with UK gone, there is a scenario in which all these sort of bad types of harmonizations, bad types of integrations are pushed through and uh, you know, small countries don't really have a say in it. Can, can I uh, pick up maybe a point or two there? Of I mean, obviously it's not for me to speak on behalf of the European Union. I, 
I did work in both Ireland and Greece when they were going through economic crisis, and I have been called a jinx from time to time. You know, so uh, watch out, Atlanta. Uh, things are going downhill. But uh, no, I, th I think there was a, there was obviously a very big movement stimulated by President Macron of France that uh, it was now the time to discuss about the future of Europe. They had got through some of those economic crises, uh, or they had found solutions to to buy more time. And he wanted this debate about the future of Europe, which I, I think it, it probably does need to happen. Uh, uh, from a United Kingdom's perspective, uh, we need the European Union to be as successful as possible. You know, it's, it's on our doorstep. It's our biggest trading partner. We want that to maintain. We work so well with the European Union in many areas. But as he said, we left for reasons around uh, what was the model we preferred. And we wanted to take back control of our laws and regulations. But we still need the European Union to, to be successful. But I think uh, the frustration within the European Union and within some member states is that the last three and a half or four years, the focus has been on Brexit. So they've not been able to get on with the, what does the European Union become without the United Kingdom. Uh, we're obviously very interested in observing that debate. But our focus at the moment is trying to build that forward looking relationship with the European Union. But we do need the EU, Brussels, the Commission, and the member states to be, to remain some of our best and most reliable partners. But there are tensions, as Z says, uh, around uh, which direction to go. And I think some of those did feed parts of the debate within the United Kingdom. Very good. Uh, I want to want to pursue this line of thinking uh, here a little bit further, but in the meantime, I want to remind our audience members that you can submit questions into either the chat or Q and A functions. And uh, coming up in about uh, fifteen minutes or so, I'll I'll be uh, going through those and and posing those to our panelists. So please get those questions in there. Um, but I, I want to. Andrew posed something to you that's a bit of a, a spinoff from something Z was saying. Now, obviously, and, and, and you were just confirming, the European Union is going to be deciding in sort of in which direction or directions it goes, depending on which uh, issues we look at. Also, the, likewise, the United Kingdom uh, has, a, has a new ability to, to decide for itself uh, many of the directions it will take mm -hmm. in, in different issues. So. Uh, You've had elections there recently. Uh, that obviously has some bearing on the immediate future. But, but tell us a little bit about, you know, what are the, how, what are those discussions like? What are the possibilities out there? And, and what is the, what is the chosen direction, you know, for the foreseeable future look like? Thank you very much, Kyle. Uh, I mean, the United Kingdom has been a global nation for generations. We will remain so. We're still one of the permanent five of the Security Council. We're still a big partner in NATO. We're the world's fifth largest economy. So, so at this moment in time, one of the things that flows from our decision to leave the European Union is we now have national competence for our international trade policy. Anybody who lives in the United States at the moment can understand the importance of international trade policy, both as an economic, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, but also as a political tool. So at this moment in time, at leaving aside COVID, which we might come on to uh, uh, a little bit later, but uh, our two big priorities are to negotiate a comprehensive free trade agreement with the European Union. So negotiations have been put in place around that. Uh, the most recent were last week. There, we do face a major obstacle because the European Union is insisting that the United Kingdom, in order to get tariff-free, quota-free access to the European Union single market will require to be aligned in terms of workers' rights, environmental standards and regulations, which we as a nation state can't accept. So we're looking for a free trade agreement between the EU and the UK, which is very much based on the Canada model, which allows for access to markets, but it doesn't enforce the United Kingdom to just simply take on board any of the legislation that uh, operates within the EU. So we want a Canada-style free trade agreement. And if we can't get that, we did a deal that allowed us to leave. So we would trade with the European Union in perhaps a suboptimal way for both sides, 
which would be along the same lines as Australia. Our second big priority, and this represents our real direction of travel, is around doing a free trade agreement between the United Kingdom and the United States. Negotiations, the first round, took place over the last couple of weeks. We see that as the largest economy in the world, meeting the fifth largest economy in the world, with such a sophisticated trading relationship in terms of investment, more than one million invested in each other's country. Uh, economies, in terms of two-way trade, more than a quarter of a trillion dollars. And I, I was surprised when I came here that more than one million British citizens uh, every day go to work for US subsidiaries in the United Kingdom, and more than one million and a half, 1.5 million US citizens go to work for British companies in the US. So that's a sophisticated relationship. But we want to go further. We want this to be the gold standard in terms of free trade agreements. And what we are understanding from the White House, from Ambassador Lighthizer, the trade representative, is that people want to do this at an accelerated pace because it suits the UK and it also suits the United Kingdom. So much of our approach and our priorities are focused around economic engagement, remaining a player on the world stage, but also driving forward this uh, free trade agreement agenda. And, and following on with that, you know, uh, you've, you've been uh, here in Georgia for a couple of years now. Uh, this is a big trading uh, mm -hmm. hub for the country with our ports, uh, with the airport, the big logistics uh, industry here. Uh, to the extent you can, tell us a little bit about what may be the benefits for <coughs> Georgians and Georgia companies could be from a really well done comprehensive US-UK free trade agreement? Well, the, the, the benefits, I mean, if you look at GDP, uh, you're not talking about a growth of 3%. What we, what we, our analysis suggests is that it could boost UK-US trade by up to $20 billion. Uh, but what it could do very successfully is allow for freer flowing trade less tariffs, less quotas, more progress in digital services, more progress in financial services. Where the UK, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat. Uh, where the UK and US uh, have the opportunity to lead the development of these industries, to, to act as a counterpoint to some of that regulation we were talking about earlier. But if you look at the Georgian economy, which has based itself in not having uh, all its eggs in one basket, I think you find a very similar diversified economy in the United Kingdom. So we are actively pursuing and promoting better relationships between financial services companies, between the city of London and the city of Atlanta around the payments industry. We are supporting our tech development around some of the grand challenges facing society. So the future of mobility, clean growth, uh, how we use data, and importantly, at times of a global pandemic, pandemic, sorry, how do we help people live healthier lives for a longer period? That all comes with a lot of government investment. So we see all those things that people understand. We see logistics, agriculture, financial services, the automotive and aerospace sectors as real strengths of the UK economy. And also that's Max in Georgia. And we're also beginning to understand that uh, Atlanta sees itself as growing. I was reading some statistics around the Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies that were published overnight. And Atlanta continues to attract high quality corporate companies. But those are acting also as the engine, which is very uh, impressive. Those corporate companies are acting as the engine for innovation, for uh, development and for research within the States. And they're trying to change the focus of the Atlanta economy. So there is really sort of Atlanta 4.0. Very good. Uh, Z, I want to I want to get back to you here and um, I, wanna, I want you to take off your Lithuanian or European hat and put on your uh, free marketeer hat and, and tell us a little bit as, as a an interested uh, somewhat inside somewhat outside observer here to this dynamic, you know, what what, what are you hoping to see um, that will come about as a result uh, from both from Britain's leaving the, the European Union, but also its, its uh, negotiations around the world and with countries like the United States uh, going forward? 
I always have my pre-market year hat on. It's just uh, I can I can have many hats on the same on the same time, but it's a free market year hat which is dominating. So call it personality disorder, but uh, that's that's the hat I go I go with. So okay, I'll start with what I would want to happen, and then I'll finish what I will think will happen. So obviously, uh, just like we talked to our colleagues in UK, uh, the UK, obviously they're very pro free market libertarians, and they say you know once we exit the EU, we can implement all these free market reforms that the EU is now not allowing us. And my sincere response to them was, well, I hope this is what happens, and I hope. So I think, I do hope that actually, you can make a good example of this, of showing how national governments, when, when they are smarter, they can actually outperform supranational governments. So I think that, oh, I hope this comes out, as Britain comes out as a more free market country, I hope that European bureaucrats get the message and say, well, people don't want too much Europe, and uh, basically, we move towards freedom as, uh, as both as UK and Europe and perhaps even the United States. So this is what I hope for. What I think will happen, I think, is, is, is much growth. Uh, one thing I think that people sometimes uh, forget about Europe is, sure, Europe creates many bad things. But then again, it also prevents many bad things. So for instance, uh, just like you uh, in, the, in the States, you have your Interstate Commerce Act, meaning Florida cannot, cannot ban uh, Georgians from going to Florida or bringing Georgia peaches to Florida, uh, even though I bet someone in Florida proposes that. And the same thing applies in uh, in European Union, for instance, French winemakers, and I'm sorry for picking on French, but they're just sympt symptomatic. So French winemakers for, for a long time have been complaining about Spanish winemakers who make cheaper and better wine uh, and bring it to France and outcompete the local producers. Uh, now, Countless, I mean, if you're talking about the lobby, there is a huge lobby to ban Spanish wine from coming into, into France. But uh, all, all, all these kind of movements or these kind of legislation would be impossible because it would be struck down by European Commission because that would violate the free movement of goods. So that's one thing. Second, I mean, many, many European governments want to just give taxpayers money to, to national companies, national ineffective companies, um, for national pride or for well, once again, for lobbying interests, once again, state aid is prohibited by the European Commission rules, meaning that you as a politician, doesn't matter how many voters you have, doesn't matter what kind of rhetoric you, you speak. Once again, if you're a French company, you cannot just subsidize uh, your French companies, especially if it hurts other European Union uh, companies. So, so once again, I'm happy that we have conservatives in, uh, in, uh, in UK right now, but let's not forget that there was a time and everyone was talking about Corbyn. Corbyn or peak Corbyn, or basically, and what his rhetoric was very much different. I mean, there are suspicions that perhaps he wanted out of the EU precisely because he would pursue the industrial Britain kind of policy, which of course would be giving taxpayer money to a failing company. So I, once again, I hope that we come out of this as a, uh, as a sort of, as a movement towards more freedom for people to choose towards more free markets. But I think we should not forget that the specter of bad ideas is always there. Uh, so, and bad ideas from time to time rise up in all countries. I mean, they, rise up, they rise up in the United Kingdom, they rise up in the United States. And it is kind of sad to see that in the countries of uh, Thatcher and Reagan, you have people like Corbyn and Sanders, which are still relevant. So European Union kind of, exiting European Union uh, gives you more, more freedom and more sort of free hand. And the question is what you're gonna do. So once again, I hope, uh, it's a conservatives, and I hope we move towards more free trade and more freedom rather than less. But we should always remember that the specter of bad ideas is always on, on haunting us. Kyle, can I <coughs> pick, pick that up? Obviously, I sit here as a public servant, uh, so uh, I, I'm not politically appointed, so I have to be politically neutral. I think, I think uh, Z touched on a point uh, around stability and around uh, the UK election. I mean, the elections took place, I think, in December and came back with uh, the Conservative Party with an 84 uh, seat majority. Since that, the Labour Party has elected a new leader and uh, that new leader has given the impression that uh, he wants to work much more uh, and as much as he can in supporting the government where he thinks the government is doing the right, right thing. So there's, there's been a political shift in the United Kingdom through the elections and through the the Labour uh, 
Yeah, sure. I, I think that uh, all I can say in answer to Z's point is obviously what we want to happen is what he's just outlined. And the United Kingdom has shown great success diplomatically for a long period in delivering on what we want to happen and encouraging others to see the benefits of our agenda, not just our trade policy agenda, but our human rights agenda, our geopolitical agenda. And I think that we have shown ourselves to the United States and to others that we can be the most reliable of partners. And I think what we're doing is uh, ensuring that while we're protecting our national interests, we also have an international and a global vision. And that global vision includes uh, working well with the European Union, it includes working well with the African Union, it includes working well with Australia, New Zealand, Canada. Uh, and I think at this moment in time, there has been a decisive move in British sentiment that people refer to as that debate over the referendum that went on for four years. But I think uh, we are determined to make progress. Uh, I would perhaps counsel that some of that determination has been checked a little bit by the pandemic, which we're all trying to come to terms with. Uh, but uh, we, we remain resolute that uh, that free trade, uh, promoting human rights, acting as a positive force around the world, promoting our values is the way that we want to go. And we want to be working with our reliable partners so that we don't dodge difficult issues. And that we remain that United Kingdom that people have come to rely on and trust. Very good. Um, so I, I want to move on to some of our uh, audience's questions now because we're getting several of those. Again, you can put those into either the Q&A function or the chat function. I'll check both of those. Um, this, is, this is one that I, I want to, I, I know that the three of us had talked about when we were previewing this event um, uh, along these lines. And Andrew, I want to, to get this to you. Um, I, Obviously, the United Kingdom is, is a union of, uh, of, of uh, several parts. And uh, so that we have a question here. How does Brexit uh, affect Britain's relationship with, uh, well, I guess maybe England's relationship? Well, I'll, I'll let you feel the, the technical way to describe this. I'll read it as it's written. Uh, how does Brexit affect Britain's relationship with Scotland and Northern Ireland? Um, uh, Scotland... It, uh, the question reads, if, if she remembers correctly, uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland wanted to remain with the EU and Scotland still seeks independence. Uh, thank you very much. I caveat my response by uh, two things. First of all, I'm Scottish. Uh, well, three things. First of all, I'm Scottish. Uh, secondly, uh, no, I won't, I won't go into that. No, I, I, secondly, I'm a public servant. I mean, obviously, there was a, a very healthy and often polarised debate in uh, Scotland around uh, uh, what was happening in the UK Parliament. Uh, that's reflected in the election results where the Scottish National Par Party did very well in the recent Westminster election uh, and uh, are seen as the dominant force in Scottish politics. I think uh, it's important to bear in mind that we had a referendum on uh, Scottish independence in 2014. So those currents have been there for some time. In 2014, 54% of the population versus 46% of the population opted to remain within the United Kingdom. Obviously, since then, there has been the referendum to leave the European Union. And at such a time in the future, if there is another referendum, that could be a factor. But I believe, as a Scotsman, that uh, Scotland is stronger within the United Kingdom. It's worked to our advantage for more than four centuries. Uh, and also uh, Scottish people will have to weigh up when they get the opportunity to have another referendum. Both the, the intrinsic values and benefits of being part of the UK, but also with the economic consequences. We've obviously gone through a very difficult four year negotiation to leave a union that has only been in existence for 40 years. How complicated would the divorce arrangements and negotiations be to leave uh, the United Kingdom for, for Scottish people? So I think it's still something that, as a public servant, the, the current, the tendency, the debate is out there. Uh, the First Minister of Scotland has said that she is committed to putting that question again to the population. 
Uh, I think she has said less about it more recently because of the, the COVID-19 situation, uh, which we're all having to adjust to. But I think it will come back. And I think at that time, the UK government, uh, of which uh, I'm an official and, uh, and work to support its aims, will make a very persuasive case that Scotland's future uh, remains stronger within the UK. In terms of Northern Ireland, obviously, there's been, I was based in our embassy in Dublin and was the deputy ambassador there. So I understand uh, uh, the debates that are taking place within Northern Ireland and between Belfast and Dublin. I think uh, that the UK government has done everything it possibly could in terms of the EU negotiations to ensure that we maintain Northern Ireland's position within the United Kingdom, including agreeing a protocol with the EU about how we would uh, deal with issues related to the customs union and the single market. And again, uh, you know, all of these uh, issues will come to the fore at such a time when uh, uh, self-determination is, is seen that uh, a majority of people in Northern Ireland would like to have a vote on uh, whether it remains in the United Kingdom. At this moment in time, there is no such majority in favour of a referendum to leave the UK. So I think politics is at the centre of this, and it's for uh, the government in London to work with our partners uh, and the devolved administrations in Edinburgh, Cardiff and Belfast. And I think people would be surprised how much devolution there is to the devolved administration. And you're seeing that including in the response to COVID, where the Prime Minister is making certain measures around how to address uh, social distancing and other things within the United Kingdom. And then the First Ministers are looking to see how those measures should be applied in each of the, the other nations that make up the United Kingdom. As a Scotsman, I'd just like to point out it's an act of union that joined England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland together. So I feel very proud that uh, you know, I, I have a country and I have a nation which is Scotland. Um, the two uh, two part uh, question here related or to um, European Union policies vis-a-vis uh, -vis the UK. Uh, one, which U EU immigration policies were an issue for the UK, and, and second, um, maybe this one will will let Z handle. Would it be fair to say that the EU wants higher taxation than the UK? So Andrew, why don't you go with the first part uh, and we'll, we'll let uh, Z yeah. handle the second part. I, I think that uh, it's not particularly an immigration policy. Uh, people on the line might not know that uh, under freedom of movement within the European Union, every citizen from across the European Union has the right to move to the United Kingdom and take up employment. Uh, and there was a reported trend that that was causing issues within parts of the United Kingdom, whereby uh, people were feeling that uh, the first language in some schools was no longer English, that access to health services was under intolerable strain, and that the attractiveness of the United Kingdom as a destination was leading to quite significant inflows of, uh, we don't call them migrants, because you know, that's not where they were. They were uh, people who rightly were were uh, setting up there, living their lives, and were also uh, contributing significantly to the, the UK economy. At the same time, there was obviously a discussion about uh, migration and the UK's approach globally. And there were uh, issues around, you know, you might remember the Syria uh, influx through Turkey and Greece into the UK where uh, the EU dealt with a significant migration and refugee crisis. So those all fed into the, bit, the debate in 2016. But uh, as I, I would like to finish where I started, that many, many people from other European Union countries who moved to the UK made big significant contributions to our, to our economy. But there was a feeling, a sense that uh, uh, the United Kingdom was struggling to cope, and uh, uh, this was being really seen in terms of our uh, public service capacity. All right, uh, 
jumping into taxation, let me just sort of refer to that coming from a nation where London is now a third largest Lithuanian city. Uh, many people from Lithuania left to the UK. Uh, I think all of them, I think all of them got jobs. Yeah. Maybe like two people who did not. So all of them got jobs, all of them paid taxes, all of them spent money either in UK or in Lithuania. Um, but I would agree with Andrew that uh, there definitely is a feeling. And you know, when it comes to feelings, feelings are not necessarily very rational. Well, let me give you another example. Let me skip to France, my favorite country to take on. But whenever many people uh, talk about Islamization of France or uh, let's say immigration from North Africa to France, European Union has nothing to do with it. This is, these are sort of a still hang, uh, hangovers from a French imperial, uh, imperial past and they're, and they're sort of their own policies. So whenever many people talk about the influx of, of people from Africa, people from, from Asia into European Union, that's not the same as, people, as European Union citizens moving inside, inside the European Union. So European Union, what European Union based, if, if to put in very simple terms, European, European Union says a Lithuanian can go work in, in UK or could go work in UK and an Englishman could go work in Lithuania, but it does not say, please allow everyone from Asia and Africa to immigrate to the European Union. So those are two very separate issues. Uh, now coming back to the, to the taxation thing, I think that's a very well-crafted question. Uh, is, it, is it fair to say that the uh, UK wants uh, lower taxes than France or European, other European Union countries? I would say yes. Uh, does UK have lower taxes? And I think here yeah, the, de the, uh, the devil is in the details. I just sort of double check. So uh, UK's top personal income tax bracket rate is 45% uh, and, and starts at 150,000 pounds. Guess what it is in France? 45% starting at 150,000 euros. Uh, of course, there are countries in European Union, say like Denmark, uh, their, their sort of top personal income tax rate is 55%. It's also 45% for Germany. So there are countries with higher tax, taxes than in uh, than European, than, sorry, than UK. And then there are countries with lower taxes than actually in UK. So if you look at Bulgaria, 10% income tax rate. So much, much lower tax compared to, the, to UK. So I would say it is fair that in general, uh, Brits are more kind of a, the, the proponents of the Anglo-Saxon model, meaning lower taxes and less government. In reality, it doesn't always play out like that. I, sorry, Kyle, can I just maybe come in? I, I think Z is, is very correct to, to raise that. The, the, the general assumption around the UK, including under many Labour governments, is that we've been lower around taxation. But, but I think it's about not just uh, what the income tax level is, it's about your overall tax structure. Uh, you know, how much you support business through corporate services, tax, you know, corporate taxation, taxation of profits. Uh, but because uh, we have a model where, whereby, like many other European countries, uh, but unlike the US, we're really using that tax to fund our health services, our education. So we have to have a tax raising ability that meets our desire to have a, a welfare system, an education system, a healthcare system, which would not be the experience of some of the people on this line that, uh, you know, our national health service is free at the point of delivery to anybody within the United Kingdom. And some of those trends, as I was saying, were aspects whereby people were concerned that they had contributed to these systems for years and years and years and the inflows of people from other European Union countries were able to access the exact same services uh, without having invested over a number of years. That, that's not my belief, but you were asking around trends around that. Well, we've got a bunch of great questions here. We do just have a few minutes to wrap up. Um, I want to compliment some of the people on these questions because they've, they've given us great topics that we could have entire seminars about. And indeed, uh, I've attended s s uh, seminars uh, about uh, some of these individual questions before. So I'm, I'm sorry we can't get to all of them. I do have one that's that's very topical, uh, uh, very timely, and, and maybe is a, is a good good one to go to as our, probably our last question. But, uh, and it's related to COVID-19. Has it strengthened or weakened uh, the European Union and will it increase nationalism? 
Okay, I can take I can take a whack at this since Andrew is a public servant and I'm not, and I can tell, say whatever. I think it has definitely weakened. Uh, I cannot think of any country which was made uh, stronger by COVID. So if we're looking economically, economically countries are weaker and European Union is weaker because many people were forced to sit rather than work. But I think uh, politically uh, countries are weaker because crisis always brings out the, I shall say the less traditional parties or the less traditional approaches to doing things. Uh, I have nothing against nationalism, and uh, I think patriotism is great, uh, and I admire the, the sense of patriotism that Americans have, and uh, to, to be proud of, there's nothing wrong with being proud of one's country, there's nothing wrong with being proud of sort of the achievements of your, of, uh, of other people. I think where I would, I would draw the line is when you stop being, when you just stop being proud of your own country and you start telling them that everyone else is less of it. So this is, I think, where I would draw the line. So I think in, on that scale, there's definitely been negative developments in the EU uh, as, a, as, a, as a result of, of COVID. So I think any way you slice it, any way you cut it, any way, any sort of positive spin you put on it, COVID has made all countries weaker in every aspect. Can I, can I maybe uh, come in here? I, I don't disagree with Z. I think uh, you can see that uh, people have had to focus in a very internal way uh, in how we're dealing with that, how we're dealing with that in a locality, how we're dealing with that in a city, how we're dealing with COVID in the state, how we're dealing with that between states and the federal government. What I would say is the UK is that, uh, yes, we've been dealing with this pandemic, but we don't see this as a time to look inwardly for the next period. We see this as a time to ensure, for example, that if we do develop a vaccine and treatments, that it's not just for the benefits of the people of the United Kingdom or for those in the so-called first world. So we're about to host the, the vaccine summit on the 4th of June, which is about ensuring that the people of the poorest countries in the world have the access to the therapeutics and vaccines as they are delivered. So this isn't the time to look in on yourself. And it also plays a part to our free trade agenda. This is a, about the time to ensuring that we have the right flows of goods that we have the right access to goods. There may be some certain products based on our experience of the pandemic where we decide that we need to produce some of that on a more national basis. But I think uh, this is the time for us to really sort of uh, look to see how we can work together to avoid another international public health emergency. And this is the time to become real science diplomats, but also public health diplomats. And so we're giving a lot more thought to that because as we emerge, which I hope we will uh, in the not too distant future from this, we need to ensure that we learn those lessons. People talk about learning lessons, but I think this is the time that the UK will try and make the most of its, its global vision about global Britain so that we're not looking in on ourselves so that not being a member of the European Union doesn't mean that we are cutting ourselves off from the rest of the world. What we're actually saying is we want to do more with the rest of the world and do more with the rest of the world, sometimes with the European Union, but often with countries who want to achieve the same things as us. I think that's a perfect note to end on. And uh, so I just want to thank both of you for, for joining us and, and, and engaging in this really great conversation today. It's very interesting. And uh, I know that our audience members all enjoyed it as well. Um, so thank you both. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. And we will look forward to uh, announcing further programming in the near future. And until then, uh, thanks for everyone. Have a great week and we're adjourned. Thank you. Bye-bye, y'all. Yeah.